So thank you all for coming. Um, when, when we started thinking about the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein and I proposed that we do um, a Frankenstein week, it kind of got legs and got going and I thought we need to do something with science. I emailed Dr. Lecter. She responded quickly and enthusiastically and I was so excited that we can have this opportunity. And then she says she um, did some arm twisting and we have a panel. That's amazing. <laughs> um, so let me give you a, a little bit of my thinking about why I thought this panel was so uh, necessary and so exciting. Um, in his 1959 Reed Lecture at Cambridge University, Sir Charles P. Snow memorably articulated a long-standing anxiety about the educational and intellectual split between what he called the two cultures, the humanities and the sciences. He was not the first. In his own Reed Lecture of 1882, titled Literature and Science, Matthew Arnold argued that studying the best which has been taught and uttered in the world, both ancient and modern, includes, but is certainly not limited to literature. And as Stefan Collini notes in his introduction to the two cultures, the anxiety about harmful divisions and types of knowledge dates back even further to the Romantic period which is my period, so of course we keep going back to that, um, the period I study, with Blake's antipathy toward Newton and the more general romantic worry that calculation and measurement might be displacing cultivation and compassion. What is at stake in the two cultures debate, and how are these stakes evident in Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein? In his 1959 lecture, Snow defined the two cultures as, quote, the split between the intellectual life of the whole of Western society into two camps, what he called literary intellectuals and scientists. Snow credited scientists with the can-do attitude, what he calls optimism, that will improve the social condition in contrast to what he saw as literary intellectuals, pessimism. I don't like that part. <laughs> Snow comments that creative solutions should emerge in the clashing point of two subjects, two disciplines, two cultures. But because the two cultures have become, according to him, completely separate, existing in a vacuum, no such creative spark occurs. While Mary Shelley does not label them as such, she certainly explores these two cultures, that of scientists and literary intellectuals. Um, and indeed, although creative sparks occur in Frankenstein, they are famously a product of Victor's single-minded scientific isolation, not of the productive clash of scientific and literary thought. Over the course of the novel, Victor participates in both cultures, especially in the presence of his literature and linguistic loving friend, Henry Clairval, but he clearly privileges the sciences. Victor's humanistic study is a completely separate enterprise from his scientific pursuits, with no sense that one might inform the other. Clairval, to me, seems like he should be the perfect foil, uh, but it doesn't work that way. Clairval dies, and not very heroically, at the hands of the creature. He does not save science from itself. Um, the two cultures, science and humanities, have been cloven, and the t novel suggests both are impoverished as a result. The two cult cultures debate continues. Uh, it's continued in a lively way all you know, through, through a couple of centuries now. Sue M. Halperin, in a review of evolutionary bi biologist Stephen Jay Gould's book, The Flamingo Smile, makes the point that those choosing sides in these debates about the two cultures are, paradoxically, and tacitly agreeing that the natural sciences and the humanities are disjunctive, she says. She argues that Gould, writing so evidently as both scientist and humanist, exposes as false the premise that practitioners of, the, of science and students of the humanities must necessarily fall on one side of the cultural divide or the other. If Mary Shelley cannot imagine a productive relationship between the two cultures within the novel Frankenstein, neither does she privilege one over the other allowing them to remain in productive tension, ready to create, um, to spark creative responses, such as we have tonight. The novel itself, with its literary portrayal of scientific dilemmas, does its imaginative work, prompting readers to consider the relationship between the sciences and the humanities time and again. Two centuries later and counting, still drawing humanists and scientists, English and philosophy majors and biology majors, into the ongoing conversation about life and the life of the mind. Tonight, I am so excited to have the conversation continue. Um, I'll introduce the speakers all at once. They'll go, um, they have short presentations, and then we'll open it up to conversation, see what happens. I'll introduce them in the order they'll be speaking, but I'll say it all now. So 
So Dr. Vicki Rutger holds a Master's of Science degree in Pathology from University of Iowa and a PhD in Biomedical Science from Wright State University. She teaches principles of biology, uh, one, mo molecular cell biology, advanced cell biology, human physiology, and path pathophysiology. I hope this is all right. This is what it says on, on the <laughs> website. Um, I don't really know what she teaches, but those all sound really good. Her research interests include probiotics and gut microbiome and the history of medicine and of biology. Dr. Donna Johnson earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from University of Missouri, Columbia. She teaches microbiology, anatomy and physiology, food safety, and epi uh, epidemiology. Her research interests include infectious zoonotic diseases, yeah. Okay. Um, multi-drug resistant, uh, multi resistant bacteria. Dr. Alan Berry earned her Doctor of Medicine from Northern State Medical University in Russia. She teaches anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, and human, an advanced human dissection, and is the cadaver lab curator, whatever, there's probably a different word for that. Director, yes. Director, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually promoted to the directory last year. Oh, well, congratulations. I don't <laughs> think that's you, on the website you. yet. You should definitely you know, get the <laughs> 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 um, And Dr. Barry Brown earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature at Kalamazoo College, a Master of Arts degree in Philosophy at Columbia University, and a PhD in Philosophy at the University of Rochester. He's also studied at Queens College in New York City, University of London, and the University of Hyderabad, Hyderabad, Hyderabad in India. India. Okay, that sounds better. I was trying to say it like it looked, and that wasn't coming out. Um, and with that, Dr. Rucker, we will take it away. I'm amazed at how many people are here. This is great. So each of us have kind of taken a different um, look at Frankenstein. And I will admit right now that I am on one side of that divide because I have never read Frankenstein. However, after putting together all of this, I've decided it, it's definitely on my reading <coughs> list um, whenever I find the time. So what I'm sort of talking about mostly is kind of what was the science back then that influenced Mary Shelley and where have we gone today um, with uh, what we know. So, um, during the Victorian period, uh, Victorian science, uh, science was really in the ascendancy, um, kind of overrunning religion a little bit, and there was a lot of public engagement with science, so entertainment was to uh, go watch somebody get dissected. Um, it was believed that when science advances, then the uh, society advances. So a couple of her scientific um, influences, one was Humphrey Davy, who um, was in chemistry, and um, the one quote that I do want to say is, um, the conversion of dead matter into living matter by vegetable organs all belong to chemistry. Um, we might disagree with that. Uh, one of her other probably really strong scientific influences was Luigi Galvani. Um, and his experiments with electricity. It was called galvanism. And he was able to take animal tissue that basically was dead and hit it with electricity and it would start um, having reflexes, but it looked like it was suddenly alive and the legs would start twitching or um, when he was working on the frogs. So that was kind of one of the first things that um, looking at science was the electricity being put with life. His nephew, Giovanni Aldini, uh, kind of took it one step further and started doing the same thing with electricity, but on corpses. And um, he talked about reanimation of the dead, and apparently this became quite the public engagement because he took this show on the road all over and uh, one of the uh, big uh, public demonstrations was, happened to be on my birthday in 1803, not that I'm that old, <laughs> um, <laughs> but he um, was using corpses of dead uh, murderers and dead criminals and using it and hitting it with the, elas uh, with the electricity and so they started making <coughs> jokes about it in the um, 
media. Okay, so how do you create a monster? Um, I went back and was looking at some of the quotes that referred to this, and he talked a lot about the complexity of the human body with all its fibers and muscles, et cetera, et cetera, and figured it was going to be super difficult. And he also started studying a lot with um, the science of anatomy, and a churchyard was to him merely the receptacle of bodies deprived of life. And he went into a whole lot of study about decomposition of bodies, and that's what Dr. Johnson is going to talk about. Uh, he began collecting and arranging his materials and worked for nearly two years, which is basically impossible to do, but for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate um, body. And in, discover in discovering the cause of life and he uh, became capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. Now, a couple things with this. First of all, Mary Shelley never said that he stitched together body parts. Um, she never said anything about lightning being the bolt of lightning that reanimated everything. And she never used the word scientist because it had not been coined yet. It was not coined till approximately 1833 by an English um, man named Werewall. So she couldn't have used the word scientist. Okay, so that was science then. So what have we learned since? What do we use science for today? Well, the most obvious one is the defibrillator, which probably everybody has seen, either on TV or in actual use, and that is, of course, putting electricity into a body. However, this really bugs me, so allow me my soap, opera, uh, my soap box right here. <laughs> if you ever watch those medical shows on TV, they claim if you're flatlined, if you're dead, this will bring you back to life. Okay, that is totally false. All right, what the electricity does in this case is actually stop the heart. And then the heart's normal pacemaker is supposed to get it started again. So if you apply the paddles to somebody that is flatlined, you're not doing a thing. Okay, so just keep that in mind the next time you watch a medical show. All right, so Frankenstein, 200 years <laughs> later, has definitely come into our uh, vocabulary um, as well as our science. And um, you can go, uh, there's this whole glossary of Franken words. Okay, Franken mouse, who happens to have a normal human ear growing on the side um, to possibly be used for transplantation. But there's also, um, you've probably heard Franken food um, with the whole uh, genetically modified organisms. And it was amazing because half the words on there I had not even heard. <laughs> All right. So let's look at where we're at with different science. First of all, transplants. Everybody's heard of that. Um, right now, the kidney was the first. It's also still the most common. But nowadays, we can do liver, we can do heart, we can do um, lungs, pancreas, intestines. But where are we going with it? Well, right now, there are a couple of doctors um, one is Italian, but they're working in China to do head transplants. Okay, you may have heard that my students told me this one. All right, it is all over. Um, he claims they've had a successful one, but that was on dead bodies, which doesn't exactly count in my book. <laughs> um, so we still don't know if we can do it. Uh, but he claimed he was going to do a real one by December of last year. So we kind of passed it. But there is a certain person that is very um, anxious to be the first head transplant patient um, because of the disease he has. He's um, very uh, disabilitated, but his mind works just fine. So we may hear more from this. OK, what other science can we do now? Well, we're looking at bionics, robotic exoskeletons. Um, where they are helping people um, that are paralyzed move um, due to the um, exoskeleton. 
um, things like that. Next are artificial limbs, could learn to maybe make some of the decisions, um, type things like that. We also are looking at mechanical organs. We actually have a few. Dialysis, if you've ever heard of that one, is basically a mechanical kidney. But we also have a number of um, things like the cochlear implants and um, external, uh, sorry, pacemakers, things like that. Where are we going next? Um, hopefully maybe fully artificial pancreases, eyes, lungs, growing. Um, we're looking at um, all kinds of different ways to um, have machines do what our organs have stopped doing. And then one big area is the lab-grown organisms, or organs, sorry about that. Um, we can take the patient's own tissue, put it either into, on, on some type of um, scaffolding, um, possibly also using 3D printers and start growing um, a number of organs. Uh, that's what was happening with the ear. They started it growing, put it on the mouse for the whole, um, blood supply and everything, and then the hope is to transplant it back into the patient. We get around a lot of things with this one. Um, something like a thousand people die every day waiting for, a uh, for an organ to be transplanted. So we have this great need. And so they're looking at all kinds of different things. And then of course we're also trying to s start from scratch and build our own people, which would be cloning. and. Um, Tweaking it will get easier as we learn more and more. So what we get is a complete human or monster, depending on how you want to look at it. That takes a lot of money, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of um, equipment, takes a lot of people believing in you and funding you. So the easier way is to go onto the internet and you can find paper monsters <laughs> that you can print and put together yourself. <laughs> or if you don't want to do that way, then one of our more exciting areas that we're seeing right now is gene editing. And basically what we're looking at is fixing whatever was wrong and taking out what was wrong, putting in what was supposed to be there in the first place so that we are repairing genes. Um, right now they have done some experiments with this where they take the cells out of the person, engineer, edit them, put them back in with the hope of making whatever protein or whatever is missing originally. The eventual hope on this one is to be able to do it without having to take the cells out to make it a permanent editing job that would replace whatever um, is not working correctly. So there's a lot on the horizon. You may have heard of it. It's called CRISPR and uh, Cas9. So um, this is going to be in the news a lot in the future. So will we ever bring back the dead? <laughs> well, they thought about it in popular science back in February of 1935. And we're still looking at it today. This was written just a few years ago. And they're doing actually an amazing amount of research on how to keep you basically from dying. Um, you've probably heard of the children who have like fallen through the ice in a really super cold and they've been down for 45 minutes, 60 minutes, something like that and they bring them up and they're able to revive them. So we know there's a lot with um, being able to lower the body temperature and things and then we, we have a kind of saying, um, you're never dead until you're warm and dead because you can look exactly dead when you're cold, but as soon as you warm them up, they can be alive again. So whether they were exactly dead, up to each of us. Okay, so I'm gonna end with a couple of quotes, one from Victor. Learn from me how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge. Um, the other is my favorite quote from Jurassic Park. The uh, mathematician Ian Malcolm said, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And that leads me to how should we look at Frankenstein, um, especially from the scientific side. Is it uncontrolled medical experimentation? Is it science gone rogue? Is it scientific greed and glory? Is it a cautionary um, story? Or 
can you look at it as displaying the magic and the wonder of science? And so I will leave that up for you to decide. And also, Dr. Barry Brown with the uh, philosophy degree can also <laughs> help us with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you all very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Um, Johnson. I really do know your name. <laughs> So if you got here earlier, I want everybody to know that all three of us, Moonlight for IT, so if you're a student and a faculty member and you have trouble, no worries. We're here, right? You saw us fumbling around with our computer, right? <laughs> so um, so um, Vicki had asked me to participate in this and she wanted the topic you know, to be just what happens with dead bodies and what's the process that occurs. So I don't have uh, pictures that are too gruesome. I just want to tell you that. So we'll go ahead and get started with that. And when she was talking to me about this, she sent me this quote from chapter four, so I emboldened. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the, of the human body. And then um, the body had become food for the worm. Now I was led to examine the cause and the progress of the decay. So that's where she told me just to jump and take off. And so aren't you excited, right? <laughs> so. Um, First, we need to start with a little story, okay? And we need to learn about the Mortis family, okay? The Mortis family has three brothers. We have Al Gore Motor, uh, Mortis, Liver Mortis, and Rigor Mortis. So Al Gore Mortis, he was definitely the coolest, okay? Remember that, he was the coolest. And you can tell that because doesn't he have a groovy hat on, right? And then Livermore uh, Morgus was the lazy son. So he always gravitated to the lowest spot because he didn't want to waste any energy. And then Rigor Mortis, he was the oldest. He's the best known. Maybe you've even heard of Rigor Mortis, right? The oldest son. He's known to be very inflexible in thought and body. <laughs> okay? So let's look at these a little bit further and we'll talk about Alger Mortis. But first, I want to preface this whole post-mortem examination with the thought that there's some variables and the major variable is the environmental temperature. So I'm going to give you some time frames and we're going to look at this, but it is totally dependent upon the environment and also things like um, body condition, how much uh, subcutaneous tissue, aka fat, is present, or if it's another mammal, something like the presence of hair or wool. So those all play a role in this. So the first um, thing, also I do want to tell you that all of my pictures are from animals, not humans. Okay, so there we go. That makes it okay, right? <laughs> that makes it okay. So um, stage one is Alger Mortis. And Alger Mortis, remember, he was the coolest one, right, with the cool groovy hat. And what happens in Alger Mortis, stage one, is that the body is just cooling to environmental temperature. Okay, so it's cooling off. Um, again, remembering that it's dependent upon ambient temperature, uh, body condition, and presence of hair. So if we look at these eyes, and these are actually cow eyes, we can see that there's an opacity right in the center. That's actually the lens. If this was an anti-mortem eye before death, we would say, ooh, that's cataracts, opacity of the lens. But this is a common uh, sequela of outer mortis. Just the proteins are um, losing their shape and structure as the body's cooling. So outer mortis, sun number one, stage number one. The second thing that happens, the second stage is liver mortis. If you remember, the definition of that sun was he was the um, lazy one, right? He always gravitated to the bottom. So what that is, is that gravity pulls the um, blood to the dep dependent portion of the capillary beds, meaning that it, gravity takes it down. So if we look at this, this is sheep, okay, sheep, and this is what we call, uh, this kind of common language, a pluck. Isn't that a funny name, a pluck? And a pluck is the trachea or windpipe, we have the bronchi, and we have the lungs. And if we look at this, we can see that this is lighter, this is darker. So 
liver mortis, pooling of the blood to the depend, the downside. So obviously this was darker, so that would have been the downside. Okay, kind of gruesome, a little. Yeah. Okay. Then the third uh, stage. This takes place about six to eight hours post death. Again, very dependent upon environmental temperature and those other couple of factors. It's cow, of course. I think you can tell. And rigor mortis is the stiffness of death. Um, and remember, he was the older, inflexible uh, son. Um, now, this stiffness is actually due to the depletion of ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy molecule for the cells. And that energy molecule has the important job of unlocking the contraction units in the muscles. So if we deplete that, those contraction units stay locked, Therefore, we have the stiffness of death, okay? So, um, again, it is about six to eight hours post-death, and it lasts one or two days, right? Okay, so with that, we need to have a little rigor quiz, okay? So, it, you know, this is what we do here, right? We make sure you're engaged. Um, so which of these, I don't know, is it a moose, a mooses, or a mises? I don't know. Do you guys know? Just moves. <laughs> uh, which one would be in rigor mortis the earliest after death? The cow or the calf? What do you think? The calf? Okay. So everybody think the calf? Is that what we think? Maybe afraid to say. So why why would you say it would be the calf? Less fat. Less fat. Less fat. And then maybe that also leads to the thought of less glucose stores, less ATP, right? So yes, and that's right. This uh, this calf would maybe be in rigor mortis in about an hour post death. The cow, well, she's in good shape. So she's in good body condition. So she would have some ATP stores that could still, um, uh, so she wouldn't develop the stiffness quite so quickly. Unless, of course, she was exhaustively ran before she died. And then that would affect it because she would use up all of her energy, right? Well, you passed. You passed a little rigor quiz. Okay, so those are our first three stages of death. And you know, we have so many English people in here. I should have double checked for misspelled words. So <laughs> forgive me, forgive me if there are some. Or certainly don't look at the grammar, okay? But what happens, the rigor mortis in this bottom uh, bullet, it actually will persist, but then those links, those contraction units that are stuck, actually will finally dissolve when the tissues start going under uh, something called autolysis. Or if we break that word down, it's like self, uh, uh, self-destruction. They actually start just uh, destroying themselves. And that's when those bridges in the muscle break down, and then the rigor mortis, that, that one leaves and autolysis sets in. So this is, we could say, like the fourth stage. And here is a horse kidney. And with autolysis, the tissues become kind of softened. So maybe you can look at this, even if you've never seen a kidney. Um, and, and I bet all I can really see this, but it has kind of a softened appearance. You know, there's not much structure to it. As a matter of fact, it's not even recognizable as a kidney. Now, that we do have some variation in the tissues that become kind of self-dissolving, and that is based on the number of proteolytic enzymes, which are enzymes that break down proteins. So if we have tissues that have a lot of, of those enzymes, they will actually undergo autolysis more quickly because there's an abundance of enzymes. So we have GI tract, pancreas, gallbladder. Can you think of others? You know, quiz time, right? You could say kidney, right? Kidney? Yeah. Liver. Liver. Very good. Very good, Dr. Lawson. Okay. <clears throat> and then, following autolysis, we, we get to the really icky stuff. And that icky stuff is putrefaction. Okay, so in our body, our normal microbiota, the normal resident bacteria that we have, we have those in a number of a of 100 trillion, we have 30 trillion cells. So that's a lot of bacteria on us and in us. Well, after death, post-mortem, 
mortem, some of these bacteria start proliferating, okay? When bacteria proliferate, what that means, they grow, they reproduce, they become greater in numbers. And when they do that, they speed up this autolytic process, they start producing gases, and you can see this cross-section of, of this um, um, liver, and I think this was a sheep liver, it may have been a pig liver, I can't quite remember. But anyway, you can see little holes, and those are the gaseous, uh, that's the gaseous process. As a matter of fact, they have a nickname, these little uh, microorganisms, and they're known as cadaver bacilli, which is the shape of a bacterium. And also, notice that humans are called cadavers, and animals are called carcasses. So we have that distinction, too. Okay. So now we're really getting to the good stuff. So we have all these bacteria producing enzymes, producing gas, and as that normal flora decomposes, the carcass or the cadaver, we have the gaseous production, and then we have the attraction to flies. Okay, so then the flies, uh, this is getting good, isn't it? <laughs> the flies will actually provide sustenance to the, for several generations of maggots. So how do we, how do we, you do that, rob the graves and have the <coughs> tissues and, and So there's like a quick rundown on what occurs after death. I had just such a wonderful talk topic to tell you, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so that's all I have and I'll give it to Dr. Barry. and I'm not going to talk about animals. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I deal with uh, dead bodies um, and human bodies every day. Probably I'm the closest uh, to human bodies, dead human bodies. And the reason uh, why we actually learn anatomy uh, from cutting the human body, because anatomy means to cut open. You know, when you drive a car, Dr. Lawson, I can hear you much better than I can hear myself. <laughs> so <laughs> We're talking so about future facts. I, I, I know, I can All right. <laughs> so, um, when you drive a car, you know, you have no idea what's inside. And, you know, you still can push gas and it will run really well. So, you're not a mechanic. In order to learn about the car, you need to take it apart, right? So that's how you learn. You take it apart, then you put it together, and then you know it. The same human body, you know we can use, it, but you know what? You only can learn about the function and structure when you cut it open. That's the only way to learn it. So the history of anatomy is the history of dissection, history of human anatomy, and that's, you know, for 2,000 years, we've been cutting it, studying it, experimenting, and this history of dissection, it's about 2,000 years old. We started dissecting about 300 BC. So, and then we continued. We continued, and William Harvey, who was the first to describe proper function of cardiovascular system, and he described two circuits, you know, pulmonary and systemic circuit. We take it for granted now. But you know what? He was the first one who described it, and he learned everything about the heart. And he said he didn't learn anatomy from the books. Books were available back then. He learned it through the dissection. He learned the structure and the function of the organs through the dissection of human bodies. And then it continues with Andreas Vesalius, and then it continues in 18th century and 19th century. And we continue doing it. These pictures are taken in our cadaver lab in our Missouri Southern State University. And our students, they still continue exploring human body, advanced explor exploration in the cadaver lab, and they dissect, they learn, and they prepare for the professional schools. So, but there is 
other way to learn anatomy. And I don't know if this thing will work or not. Okay, let's try. You see the computer. I just wanted to show you the video, and it was supposed to work. I'm not gonna, you know, it, you know, it worked, then it didn't. So let me try again. Let me try again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it, no, it didn't. It's not gonna work. So I apologize. You know, there are so many three-dimensional programs these days. There, some of them are cheaper than others. You know, some of them are pretty expensive. So, but there is another way to learn human anatomy in the 21st century. And some of the medical schools, some of the institutions, they rely on the three-dimensional programs that are expensive, but they do not require human dissection. So the question is, and I want you to actually think about this, uh, why do anatomists and future physicians they actually need to dissect. Do they? Do they need to dissect in the 21st century? Or, you know what? We can learn anatomy from three-dimensional an anatomical programs that are available, but pretty expensive. So, I'm gonna give you another information to think about. So, all right. You know that anatomical knowledge is essential. Knowledge of anatomy is essential for the medical doctor to assess the patient and to diagnose the condition. You know, it's the fact. Anatomy always been a mother, mother of medicine. You cannot treat, assess the patient without knowledge of the anatomy, where organs are located, right? Liver on the right, spleen on the left. So the problem is, that anatomical education, the time that they spent in medical school on anatomy is getting actually declined over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, there is a, uh, actually objective reason. Number one, the amount of information medical students they need to learn is growing every single day. You know, when I went to school 30 years ago, uh, we didn't have MRI. I heard about this later. We didn't know molecular biology on the same level. Genetics, you know what, oh my gosh, th 30 years ago, what did we know about genetics? Nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, Mendo's laws, you know, right? <laughs> so now there is so much more in the medical curriculum and anatomy is getting squeezed from 90 hours to 50, 30, Warning. Anatomy is, you know, it's important. And it requires time to understand and memorize. Lots of memorization in the anatomy. It takes time to learn it. So what happened over the last 20 years? Few studies, they show that knowledge uh, is actually decreased. The physicians, they decrease their knowledge from the acceptable level. Studies, that's what they show. It's not me. So another fact, in two th uh, 2015, medical errors, we call it iatrogenic cause, something that caused by the doctor, was a killer number three in America after cancer and cardiac problems. So. Technically, what I'm trying to tell you, every single day, two Boeings, you know, that's how many people, you know, fly on two Boeings are killed by doctors. So we have decrease in anatomy education, decrease of the observation skills, and more and more mistakes. So now, I would tell you that um, I probably wouldn't trust a doctor, a physician, but it's my opinion who never had, uh, you know, uh, held scalpel in the hand. And it gives much more than just a dissection skill. It gives a student first and second year in medical school appreciation and knowledge of the human body. So it's like, you know, difference between watching how other people drive a car and driving a car. So 
Second question, all right, you know, it's, you know, you have to decide what you want. Do you want your physician, your primary care provider, or the, your surgeon who is removing appendix from your body? Um, is it the first time that he actually <laughs> operated on the human body? Uh, you know, uh, he did all of these virtual surgeries before, right? So we need to think about this. Um, the medical um, world did not come up with answer. I don't know the right answer. I don't. What is better, to dissect or not to dissect? So if we're going to choose dissection, where the bodies are coming from? So historically, historically, again, 2,000 years of dissection, mainly bodies of the executed. And um, you know, look at this. Um, map of Europe, all of this, you know, and executed, they were legally allowed to be dissected in all of these countries in the Europe. So, all right, grave, uh, okay, body stolen. That's, you know, uh, Dr. Johnson, she just talked about this. So, yes, uh, they were also dissected. Also, people they murdered and they were selling these, you know, bodies to the scientists. Yes, oh, they made money, it was business. It was really good business to sell these bodies. Of course, it was, you know, it was in 17th century when, you know, during Renaissance age, when anatomists, they were so, you know, crazy about, let's learn, you know, we're gonna find new organs, we're gonna uh, identify something new. They wanted to dissect, that's why people, they were killing killing poor people. So people who committed suicides. Uh, also public women. Look at this list. Uncleaned bodies from poor houses. Look at this list. People who were dissected. The poor or the criminals. Dissection became a punishment at this time. The dissection became a punishment. It was considered as more punishment. So is it still a punishment? It actually changed. It did change in the 20th century, but our mentality has not. So the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act was signed in 1968. And it was very important that people uh, were able to donate their bodies. And next of kin could not change their will. Very important. And you know, in 19, February 1972, you see, you know, 48 states adopted it. And now, actually, every single state adopted this act. So at this time, the dissected became actually our teacher, a teacher who uh, keeps actually on giving after death. And you know, there were only two exceptions after this act was adopted. And um, they executed uh, his Joseph Paul Jornigan, probably you've heard about him. And um, his body, he was executed for the crime, you know, uh, he committed in 1981, and um, in fact, he was not uh, going to donate his body to science, but right before execution, a chaplain taught him, he convinced him in doing this. So his body is an exception. So he was executed, but he was chosen for one of the most famous programs at that time. Uh, the reason why he was chosen, he was healthy, he was very healthy, and he had proper proportions, uh, very uh, low um, uh, fat components. So before dissection and before doing this first uh, CAT scan and MRI um, visual body, uh, so um, he, they actually, you know, uh, they, they can't scan all of the body and then they dissected uh, him. So again, uh, second time uh, that we know uh, this fact, 
Um, some of the bodies of executed un or unclaimed bodies uh, from China were used for very famous, and more, maybe more, uh, some of you went to see this um, exhibition. Really, really beautiful, uh, amazing exhibition of human anatomy. Very unique type of uh, dissection and preparation of the body, uh, known as plastination. So they started it in China. And then when they started to travel all over you know, uh, the world, and especially they came to America, uh, they uh, found out that some bodies, they were not donated. And some bodies, um, they were bodies of executed people. And uh, certain cities, they rejected uh, this exhibition. So that's what happened. And I don't know for, the, for a fact, but Branson, you know, they had this exhibition for about two weeks, and then they left. I believe that it was one of the reasons one why they left Branson. So do dead bodies deserve respect? You know, um, I, you know, I teach my students, treat cadavers, treat them as the first patients. Because, you know, donors become our teachers. They continue, actually, their biography. They, you know, our biography will end, right? We're going to die, all of us, with no exception. So we're going to die, and this is going to be uh, the end, the last day of our biography. But these people, you know, we have six people in the cadaver lab right now. And they keep on giving. They gave their bodies. And so students, about 200 students uh, right now learning from them. They are excited learning anatomy. Uh, tomorrow they're going to have an exam over, over the skeletal muscles. And I've never seen so much interest in anatomy as we see right now. So. These donors, these uh, cadavers, um, I think they deserve not just respect, but you know what? They keep on giving, and they make us better people. So why I said they, made us, they make us better people? We um, did study, it was longitudinal study, and we collected uh, some information, you know, from our students before and after taking the class. We were shocked when responses after co uh, com completing cadaver-based course um, about um, organ donation. Look at this increase. This is willingness to donate organs before taking the class, and this is after completing the class. It makes us better people. All of the students, you see, they're young, and they become much more mature in the dissection suit. So how do dissectors save, save their humanity? You know what, yes, um, dissecting in the cadaver lab, surrounding by, you know, six cadavers, you know, cutting through the skin and the tissue. You know, it's a great lesson, the great lesson for the future physician. Because in order to become a physician and to take care of the patient, we need balance between empathy and clinical detachment. It's very important because it will allow uh, us to be an observer. And in order to diagnose the condition, we need to be able to observe in order to be able to see. So. Yes, we need to be helpers, compassionate helpers, but we, at the same time, we should not be too emotional. So what we can do with our body after death? Ten uses for your body. Ten ideas, you know? All right. So we can uh, sign for the organ donation. Unfortunately, you know, we're getting older, and you know what? Our organs are not getting better. So, and that's why when, you know, in older age, we're not going to be qualified for organ donations. So, tissue donation, it's slightly different, like donation of cornea, for example, considers tissue donation, and it can be, you know, at any age. So, anat uh, anatomy education. So, this is the most common, you know, use 
for the cadavers uh, in the present day, but also, and um, I watched uh, how uh, residents, they uh, perform surgical procedures, they train and they experiment new surgical procedures on the fresh tissue cadavers. Not all of the cadavers are preserved. Some of the cadavers, they, we can use them as a fresh tissue for a short period of time, and we keep them in the fridge in the certain temperature. So, and the surgeons, residents, instead of experimenting on us, they experiment these procedures on the fresh tissue cadavers. So, forensic anthropology, crash test cadaver, you know, uh, in safety testing, research, very important in research and anatomical education, you know, there is repercussion. We use them sometimes at the same, uh, I mean, at the same time. Plastination, that's what you know, um, this is very special type of dissection, you know. If you don't want your organs to be dissected, you can just, you know, um, be a skeleton, you know, and we can learn skeletal system. So, because, you know, most of the skeletons we have are plastic uh, skeletons these days. So, and, you know, museums. Museums are interested uh, if, you know, we have some anomalies. So, anomalies, rare anomalies, museums can be interested. So, these are 10 great uses of our body, you know, after that. And it can be not the end of our biography. It can be actually just the beginning of a new step. All right, so that's what I want to tell you. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I guess I'll stand up over here or at least attempt to. So I feel a little bit like I'm on one of those tests where they give you like a, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter, and a cow, and they say, which one doesn't belong in this group? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, what I have is sort of a, uh, a take on the attitude thank you, towards, uh, towards science that's expressed in the Frankenstein novel, and say a few words about that. So it's a little bit of a, uh, a synthesis of what others have said here. So the, but the, the standard interpretation of the Frankenstein novel is this is the arrogant scientist pursuing knowledge and then w w without any real uh, uh, concern for the consequences of what he's doing and then, or she, and then unleashes the monster on the world. Doomsday arguments. Um, so we're told, for example, that Robert Oppenheimer, who was in charge of the Manhattan Project and development of the, had his Frankenstein moment when they tested the first bomb, and what, what have we done, what have we unleashed on the world. Um, and th this is one interpretation of the novel. I'm no expert on this. I've read some others that are equally interesting. But this one is, you know, the, the theme is scientists shouldn't be playing God. They shouldn't be tinkering with nature. When they do, nature will get its revenge. Right? The monster in, in Frankenstein, the novel, gets his revenge, right? Um, uh, that um, uh, in, in ethics it's always put in, you should, and, and I don't like this argument, we shouldn't play God. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, you know, tinker with nature in ways that we, there are unforeseen consequences that are going to then unleash catastrophe on humanity. And recently there have been all kinds of scientific advances that these arguments have been uh, proposed for. So for example, genetically modified crops. I mean, we hear all the time this is going to unleash terrible things on humanity. I mean, not to mention, I mean, nuclear weapons obviously is one of those too. Um, uh, another one is uh, in vitro fertilization. When they first started with in vitro fertilization, uh, people gave Frankenstein arguments about that. Well, you know, we're going to be unleashing terrible things on humanity. Um, cloning is another example. This is, this is Frankenstein, right? This is scientists pursuing heedless of the consequences. Uh, another one nowadays is artificial intelligence, right? There's all these doomsday arguments about we're going to create machines that are going to 
take over the world and kill all human beings. So I have one of these that maybe is a little closer to the Frankenstein novel itself, um, and that is the creation of artificial life or synthetic life. And apparently there's a whole new branch of biology now, synthetic biology. And one of the people at the forefront of this is a guy named J. Craig Venter, in his Venter Institute. And what they've done is they've created, Venter claims, synthetic cells. So what he did, and this is phenomenal that they can do this, is he manufactured DNA. He wrote the genetic code for a genome and then programmed the machine to take the four bases of eight, I just know the letters, right? A, T, C, and G, right? Uh, and the machine apparently synthesizes the DNA and then he took the nucleus out of the cell and put the synthesized DNA into the cell and what he claims is the DNA is like the software. It tells the cell what to do and so he controlled the processes, the metabolism of the cell and you can then engineer what byproducts the cell is going to produce. So the hope is we can create, this would be an inexpensive or more efficient way of making vaccines, making insulin, making drugs, making fuels. You can make hydrogen gas if you can engineer cells that will produce as a byproduct hydrogen gas. Uh, what, at, at first what Venter did and his team at the Venter Institute, and, and again, how they do this is incredible, right? I mean, to, re, to first to map the genetic code of a bacteria, and then to synthesize something, and then to take it out and put another one in is, is how they do this is incredible. Um, what they did at first was a certain kind of bacterium and they created the genome of that bacterium, but they added things into it. So apparently, to, to make sure that it really worked, it wasn't just running its old DNA, they apparently, and they're arrogant uh, scientists, right, they, they Venter calls it watermarks that he put into the, the code. And apparently there's a, a code from the the base pairs to letters, and they wrote their, the scientists wrote their names in the code, and they also put in various quotations, and an email address. So any researcher who can unlock the code and read the quotes and the email address, and they can send it to Venter, and they'll get a lot of money or something like that. <laughs> if they can do that. Uh, this, he did this back in 2010. More recently, what he's been working on is, and I get, he's trying to get the, the minimal genetic code that you need for life. And they, they, they sort of tinkered with this to figure out how many genes are actually necessary for a cell to actually continue to be alive. And this is what the, the number that, that, let me see if I find the number exactly. It was, uh, 473. So what they did, they, they had the, the genome and they removed genes from it and then see what what's the minimum number you, you need in order to maintain life. 470, is that possible? 473? Uh, and, and apparently, this is what I read, they have no idea what 170 of those do. Uh, <laughs> but you need them for the cell to continue to be alive. And then what Venter thinks is now we've got sort of the chassis and now we can build on to that. So we have the basic life form and then if you wanted to produce hydrogen or insulin or whatever, you add on whatever uh, genes you need in order to do that. So he, Venter thinks this is going to be the next wave in biology, creating artificial species of life. So. Is this a good thing? If this is Victor Frank, right? We've got now Venterstein instead of Frankenstein. And now the monster is not a big green thing, but uh, a microscopic cell that it would be unleashing on humanity, right? So is, is this a good thing or a, a bad thing? Should we be doing this, right? 
Mary Shelley at Frankenstein. No, this is terrible. What are we unleashing on humanity? We shouldn't play God and create new forms of life. Because who knows what might happen, right? I mean, this is the terrible monster, bioterrorism. Some terrorist is going to get able to do this and create a microbe that's going to kill everybody, or inadvertently these microbes are going to get out into the into the environment and kill us all, and so we better not do this sort of thing, right? This is the Frankenstein argument. To me, I take the opposite view, and I think Mary Shelley was totally wrong. This is fear and timidity keeping people from pursuing uh, new horizons in knowledge, and it could be the opposite. You know, there are Sometimes in philosophy they talk about dueling do the doomsday arguments. It could be if we don't do this research, and then there's an outbreak of some terrible disease, and you know, the flu's about to kill everybody, and we don't have enough vaccines, and it takes how long to make vaccines. And this might prove to be the way to make vaccines for it quickly, so maybe there's dueling doomsday arguments here. Uh, but in this case, I think we should applaud Victor Frankenstein and say, <laughs> This is a good thing that scientists, this is not, we shouldn't be afraid of, uh, uh, of what might come from it. To some extent, the ethical issue here is moot because uh, there's so much money being put into this. Now. I mean, the, the prospects for industry are so great that this is going to happen. This is not an ethical debate that anybody's going to stop. In, in fact, from what my reading, what, what, what I've read about this is the debate now is not whether to do it, but how to do it. And it, um, Vicky mentioned CRISPR before. So CRISPR is apparently, and this is another one of these absolutely phenomenally amazing thing. I mean, how do they edit the genetic, take a little piece out and then, how do they do that, right? I mean, that's incredible. Uh, but so apparently now it's inventors in competition with people who say, instead of creating artificial cells, what we can simply do is take an existing bacterium and manipulate its genetic code to get it to do what we want. And then it's going to become which one is cheaper and which one is more efficient. So it's not a question, are we going to do this? It's a question of how, we, how we're going to do this. Uh, but again, I, I mean, I'm being a little bit glib about this and just throwing, I mean, but uh, I, mean, I, 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 I I'm a champion of the enlightenment, of science and reason and logic. And the romantic response to that, to me, was going backwards. Uh, uh, science is good. We should applaud our scientists, <laughs> right? Not, not their scary people who are going to unleash Frankenstein on the world. Uh, so I'm going to, I mean, that, that's what I have to say about that. Uh, I know, again, I feel like the the cow in the jar of money here that I, I didn't quite belong on the, on the panel here, but thank you very much. Well, we, we don't want to keep you out all night, but with, with um, the problem is you gave interesting talks, so maybe a few minutes for questions, if, if there are any questions. The nice thing about that is that um, we can, our insulin is a little bit different from, say, a pig insulin. Um, and so a lot of diabetics have problems if they've had the pig um, insulin too long, they can react against it. So the nice thing about the bacteria and possibly with the editing and everything is that you can get the bacteria to make human insulin and then extract it back out, and the patients don't have those um, immune reactions, so. I read an article in uh, Smithsonian Magazine about the uh, theoretical possibility of eradicating certain species of mosquitoes that transmit uh, malaria and the Zika virus. But there are some scientists that think that the you know, one of the potential results of that 
would be to affect other parts of the environment detrimentally, especially to human and animal life. And I guess my question is, if scientists appear to be arguing about this, you know, what is, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. Right, that's another Frankenstein argument, right? Right. They're going to unleash this money. That right. one they may be right about. <laughs> 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 Not, I mean, sometimes Mary Shelley is right. Scientists, yeah, I don't know scientists they always argue, always. Yeah. You know, yeah. they argued uh, 2,000 years ago, and they argue now. Right. So that's normal process. That's how I think, you know, uh, that's how uh, we, we develop, learn. right, through discussion and argument. So. It's necessary. It's necessary uh, in the development. No, right no one else? Mm -hmm. There may be after it happens, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just two quick comments. Uh, very touched on to what kind of advances are occurring right now and the ethics behind those. One, one comment is that if research is being done from a scientific basis in any kind of public institution, that research doesn't get done without going before a committee that approves that research. And they are looking to assess risk and things like that. Interestingly enough, Barry, you know, manipulating genes back in the 1970s, when we got the ability to use all these enzymes to cut DNA up and to put it in different things, somebody says, ooh, what if we could take a gene for toxin production from salmonella and <laughs> splice it into E. coli, and then the E. coli would you know, whatever happened to that guy on the So the scientists said, we're going to police ourselves. We're going to set up guidelines until we figure out what's what. So, so the scientists do police themselves. Now, I'm not so sure that that's true with the private venture companies who polices that. I don't know where that happens. But secondly, you're talking about gene manipulation. And I just saw a month ago one of my former students who has a very bright child who's now in his second year at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and he told me that they are now working with splicing in genes that will silence the gene that causes Huntington disease, and it will program that with a new gene. And he says it's already worked in mice. Right now they're testing that protocol on primates. And when you look at that technique, Huntington disease is a lethal mutation. If you've got it, you're going to die. There's nothing we can do for you. We have a test that will tell you whether you're going to get it or not, but it normally doesn't show up until you're 40, 50, 60 years old, so you've already had your children and passed it on to them. Okay? So the ethics of something like that, there's ethics in terms of how much gene manipulation should we do, but I don't think many people would argue that Okay, if you've got the gene for Huntington disease, you're going to die from this disease unless somebody intervenes. Give me the drug, or you know, give me the virus that's carrying the new piece of DNA, and I want it fixed, and I want to not have that particular disease. So that's kind of where things are going right now. So we're off with it. in in the lifetime of all of you that are college students right now, you're going to see a lot of genetic diseases cured through DNA technology going to happen and things that people die of routinely today, you're going to see them cured and these people aren't going to get those diseases. Well said. Mason, does it look like you have a question in the back? Yeah, so Dr. Barry, you kind of created a little anxiety in me when you said that doctors <laughs> making errors were the, <laughs> the third cause of, of death in, what it, in the United States. Yeah. Or Right 1,000 people, you know, in 2015, this was actually uh, data from 2015, 1,000 people killed by physicians every day in the United States. Okay, yeah, so the, <laughs> <laughs> so the second half of that question is then you implied that there's a correlation between a lower amount of time in the lab examining cadavers, and uh, that was the, the cause. Are there other variables involved, or is that like the single most important variable? I would say, you know, it was, uh, you know, the presentation was about anatomy, and I connected this to, but it's not only anatomy. Observation skills. You know, the most important for the physician is to diagnose the condition. And diagnosis is based on observation. How much time physicians spend with, um, with, pa with the patient on average? Did you go to the doctor? How much time physicians they spend? 
do they have time to observe? You know, that's where, you know, the lack of observation leads to the lack of the, you know, proper diagnosis and proper treatment. That's why we make mistakes. You know, and anatomy is one of the parts of this, but there are so much other factors that contribute to the iatrogenic cause of death. And this, uh, you know, this particular problem, it was approached, and they started to look at wh why there is a gap between education and practicing medicine. There is disconnect. So, and why surgeons, surgeons, uh, junior surgeons, they come from the residency, they have a lack of uh, knowledge of anatomy. And it's also fact. So all of this, you know, I would say uh, information, small facts, they lead to, you know, we have four years in medical school and we have so much information that medical students have to go through and then to practice medicine, you know. It's, it's hard to become a doctor and because we don't have enough time to educate, we don't have enough time to spend with the patient, uh, it results in so many mistakes. So I, I believe that it's multifactorial, you know, multifactors process. We need to eliminate more than few of them. Years, and it's not just doctors, I guess. Yes, all pharmacists and yes, you know, you know we we're talking about yes, but you know, in this case, they they refer mainly to the physicians. So iatrogenic, yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, but it's the number is probably the highest, and you know, I, you know, you can tell I'm from Russia, right? You know, I'm, I'm not from around here, and this, <laughs> <laughs> this you know, uh, this information traveled uh, the world real quick, and my my sister and my brother-in-law, they're doctors as well, so and they learned this fact actually before I learned it here. They said, "Do you know that?" I said, "You know." In Russia and Europe, it's a very well-known fact that, you know, physicians in America kill their patients. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, you know, this number. And uh, we discuss this problem with them, and I do believe that in America we document better than there is, you know, the documentation of cause of death happens in other countries. I do believe physicians all over the world, they make a lot of mistakes. They do. It's just in America, we document it properly. That's why we have proper number. I do believe that, you know, this is the problem. It just happens all over the world. It's, we just, we just announced this. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more question? Well, I love science, too, and I love scientists. Um, but there might be something that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. Do you all have any examples of that where you're like, yes, we are doing this thing, and maybe that thing we shouldn't be doing? So you're asking if Mary Shelley is ever right. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> <it's what laughs> Dr. Brown. <laughs> 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 so, you know, do you have an opinion? Because I think everything that is happening in science, it, it's happening for a reason. And there is, you know, science develops, you know, and there are always, you know, negative and positive. But, you know, without this, we are not going to take a next step. So I believe everything what happens in science, even, you know, right now, we look at this as a negative, negative effect, negative process, but it all will have positive effect um, in the future. Well, the, the, the big deal with, with Frankenstein was that, as you, uh, you know, so eloquently said, he was a, 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 a physician that was isolated. We don't have that now, fortunately. There, we have discussion. Mm -hmm. And it's not just local discussion, it's global discussion. I think that that is probably the, the biggest advance we have made just in the processes, you know, and the checks and balances, because we have so many people working at one time 
on one issue, and it's all over the world. It's wonderful. I teach research at the college lab, beginning research. Actually, actually it's a little bit more advanced, but, but I read research all the time. It's amazing to me how much cooperation there is, and not only be, you know, in one discipline, but between disciplines. Mm -hmm. We're always getting advice. I'm, I'm really excited. Sorry. I'm there's sorry. sometimes probably more than you want. I think that's <laughs> one of the best things we're doing right now. And, and I think sometimes things have not worked out exactly, but with the checks and balances and, you know, if it doesn't quite work out, then it just kind of, we go on to something else. And um, a l part of that is from our funding um, as to what, what's going to work and what's not. But if you think about it, I mean, all these big advances that we've gone through in the last 30 years, not a one of them has really unleashed anything that we should be scared about. I mean, everybody thought with the test tube babies. I mean, she's what, 35, 40, something like that now? And yeah, Louise Brown. And, and nobody even blinks now with in vitro fertilization or anything like that. And okay. we just keep going. And I think- I've got one that's more. an answer to this. Yeah. yeah. The stem cell. Creating you know. dinosaurs from their DNA. <laughs> 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 yeah, we have. Yeah. Do the, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. We don't want any tyrannosaurus. <laughs> Remember the stem cell research, the stem cell treatment. You know, 20 years ago, uh, we had so many our arguments, discussion about stem cells and what's happening right now. You know, uh, stem cell research treatment, it's very common, very popular all over the world. In uh, the US, though, is it still it's still yes. embryonic. It's still embryonic, but we've discovered so many yes. other stem cells there's in our body. We yes. don't need the embryonic stem and, cells and anymore. In certain states, they're still against it. Mm -hmm. And we don't and understand why. We might not have found all these other stem cells except for all the discussion about the embryonic ones. So we still move forward. Oh, oh my word, this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing, but I'm also concerned because some of you probably have to teach in the morning. Yeah. Are you willing to be answering questions or shall we let questions become more individual? A couple more questions. A couple, a couple more? A couple more. Okay, well I saw right behind you, and, and then we'll come forward. How's that? Right behind you, yes, because okay. no, that hand's been up for a while, yes. I think we still hear from them. When they've got something, they still have to publish. They have to um, still talk with colleagues in um, public institutions and everything. I mean, could they be doing something that we've never heard about? Yes, but if it destroys them, then it's not going to, you know, other people aren't going to take it up or something. So I, I don't think we have the isolation that we used to especially like with Bentner, he, he talks about everything, I think. <laughs> I mean, he does a good job of publishing, so um, theoretically, yes, they could hide something, but since they're basically out to make money, if they hide it, then that's kind of cross against what they're trying to do. But there is a sort of a concrete example involving fertility clinics. So you've probably all heard of Octomom, right, the, mm -hmm. with the eight babies. And so there's a whole debate about whether to have government regulation of fertility clinics. And in other countries that have national health care systems where the government is paying for it, it's easier to, for the government to impose those kinds of restrictions. So you, you're sort of raising a whole can of worms mm -hmm. now about America has this tradition of we don't want so many government regulations, but yet we need them. Um, 
So I think that's where that's how this one's going to play out. Also, within this group. there's also the FDA oversight. If you're a corporation and you want to sell whatever it is that you are producing, you're going to have to get FDA approval for it. So there is that that sort of control that we're going to sell. Because their major motivation is money. It's interesting to me that uh, this panel has presented um, science and the humanities, the art, as if they're opposed to each other, at least you've touched on that idea. And um, one of the things that the romantic artists and writers are doing, uh, and William Blake is a really good example of that, he was both an artist. Um, they were not rejecting science, but, but responding to the age of reason and all the emphasis put on the human, human reason, human intellect. And what um, Blake was doing in his, in his writing and his art was exploring, wait a minute, you can't just have the mind. You can't just have reason. You, uh, you have to address the total person, which means not just the mind, but the body and the psyche and the emotion. And that was one of the things that Mary Shelley was exploring, and the relationship between the monster and and his creator was that split between the intellect and and the psyche. And and you know what? You all are right in that there's so much in Western culture that privileges precision, that privileges efficiency and science. And oh, we'll, we'll get into the arts if we have time <laughs> for that, and if we have money for that. But but they are both necessary, and and science by its very nature is interdisciplinary, as is art. So that's my comment slash observation. And my question to you all is: Do you see any interweaving, any in instances of in a true interweaving of the sciences and the humanities? I, I would say science journalism, <laughs> um, and we need more of it. Um, I believe more writers that know how to um, translate scientific jargon so the public can understand it, and because we all have jargon in our in our disciplines and everything. And I don't, I don't. I think sometimes, you know, we just see the headlines on the science, and we don't see everything kind of behind it. And that's where I think sci good, good science journalism, good um, scientists that can that can write really well. I mean, we have a lot of authors that do um, write uh, artistically. Um, I guess is the best way to say it. So I think it's us taking the time to do it. And, and for scientists to take the time to read um, in addition to it. But what were you going to say? Scientific writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say um, I have an example. the body world is aesthetic yeah. body and science too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, well, and the thought yeah. it provokes. And I'm very, I'm sorry, but I think I'm going to, do you need to say this? I was just thinking of Leonardo as an yeah. example yeah. of someone who science and all like that, the way you're talking. And there are, uh, I think there are examples, but we need more of them. I also think that it's 8.30 and it's a <laughs> little warm, and I hope the conversation continues even not formally. Before you applaud our speakers, let me just say, we do have a special guest here tonight that I want to acknowledge. Um, she was a professor in English and is now retired, Dr. Doris Walters. wonderful supporter of Frankenstein Week, so we very much appreciate her support, not only in that way, but coming out and, and being with us tonight. I also want to promote our student literary journal, Border Town. It's gorgeous, I'm not only aesthetically pleasing, but the sciences are well represented in this as well. Dr. Oliveri and I were part of a conversation in which we just met tonight. So the stitched up creative um, and Dr. Gubero, we shouldn't leave him out of that. He's also in this. Um, but student writing, fac some faculties, uh, interviews, lots of things. These are free. Our students did an amazing job. We have some up here. I think there are some out in the hallway. You are welcome to take one with you. 
Um, you are welcome, if you're not in this year's issue, to be watching for the call for submissions next year. They will come out again. Tomorrow, we have our film festival. 4.30 is Old Frankenstein from 1931. James Whale and Dr. Kumbir is going to introduce that. Um, at 7 o'clock tomorrow night, is, uh, we're going from the sublime of the old Frankenstein to the ridiculous of Mel Brooks's Young Frankenstein. If you don't know it, young people, it's silly. Um, so you should come out for that. And Dr. Howarth is introducing that. And Thursday night at 7, uh, over in the library, in uh, the, the quiet room will not be so quiet at, at 7 o'clock. We're having a party, a gala, um, food will be involved, that's good. Uh, thanking everyone who's contributed, having our short story contest readers uh, winners announced, and some of them will be doing readings. So we invite you to continue celebrating Frankenstein with us, and please thank our wonderful panelists. <laughs> <laughs> Just one quick thing, because I, I, I want you all to really um, thank Zach and Amy, because um, they were the ones that reached out to us in the sciences, and we're hoping that this is the beginning of a lot of interdepartmental collaborations, and so we really thank you. <laughs>